The election fight is still underway, and it could go all the way to the Supreme Court. Our friend Sean Parnell, former Army Ranger and congressional candidate in Pennsylvania, is at the tip of the spear on this one. Sean, great to have you. Hey, it's great to be back as always, Buck. Thanks for having me. So, so tell me tell me where this stands right now, because people are, are looking still at Pennsylvania and thinking that that may be where the uh, the wall is breached on this election. What's going on? Well, look, I, I, we brought a just to provide context for listeners or viewers. We, we brought a lawsuit uh, uh, through the Commonwealth Court, through the PA Supreme Court, and ultimately it ended up at the Supreme Court that that asserts that Act 77, Pennsylvania's universal uh, mail-in absentee ballot law is unconstitutional. And look, it is facially unconstitutional. Uh, it's clear. Uh, we, we've been in three courts, as I mentioned, three courts on this buck. Only one of those three courts has, has bothered to even evaluate this case on the merits. And in that instance, they said, if plaintiffs are likely uh, to move forward on the merits, that we will win that Act 77 is is facially unconstitutional. Um, so we brought that case, uh, it, it went uh, to the Commonwealth Court where we, where we got a favorable ruling, it went to the PA Supreme Court where they dismissed it on a legal doctrine called latches, basically saying that I brought the lawsuit too late. Uh, but here's the, here's the, here's the, uh, the kept 22 that they put us in is that I couldn't have challenged the law any earlier because 200 years of PA Supreme Court case law says candidates can't challenge elections prior to them being finished. <laughs> so I couldn't challenge the, the, the constitutionality of Act 77 before the election, couldn't challenge it after. And then the PA Supreme Court dismissed it with prejudice and said that essentially, I can't ever challenge Act 77 again. So we brought it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court, um, after hearing both sides of the argument, uh, what they did was dismiss our, our petition for injunctive relief only, right? Now, what we asked the Supreme Court to do, and this is important, was just temporarily halt the certification of Pennsylvania while we debated the constitutionality of Act 77 on the merits. Now, the PA Supreme Court said, no, we're not going to halt the certification. We're, we're going to allow that to move forward. But the critical piece here is that they did not dismiss our case like so many in the media have reported. Uh, we are allowed to petition for what's called a, a writ of certiori, um, which basically is, is legalese for uh, we're asking the Supreme Court to, to hear the case on the merits. And Buck, I think that they have an obligation to step in and, and, and rule on the merits because the people of this country deserve some clarity and they deserve to know if the elections that we conducted here in the, in the, in the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania are indeed constitutional. Because right now, Act 77, uh, it's a black letter of the law, as, as, as people say, it's, it's clearly unconstitutional. And so this is the way that our system was intended to work. We're going to the courts for clarity. And, and so far, uh, we haven't had much success with the High Court of Pennsylvania uh, or the Supreme Court. Uh, but we're hoping uh, that they'll take up this case and, and allow for our petition for certiorari to pass. and and, and, and eventually rule on the merits. Sean, do you have some sense of what the timeline is on this? Because there are a lot of folks who are seeing the days pass on the calendar and, you know, inauguration day is going to be here before we know it. So how, how do we uh, view the time situation? Yeah. So we, we're going to submit our petition for certiorari today. Um, now, I don't know how long the Supreme court is going to take to act on that. The Supreme court, as I've, sort of learned as this process has gone on, the Supreme Court is a is an enigmatic body, you know? And, and quite frankly, uh, you know, the nine Supreme Court justices are all very, very smart people and, and they sort of do things that their own way, in, in their own way. And a lot of people were reading into, oh, it's a one sentence denial. Well, that's sort of typical. That's that's what they do. And, and oh, it's a nine zero opinion. There were no dissents. They don't. They don't weigh in on things like that. The, the truth is, it could. Be, it could have been a five-four decision. We have no idea, and anybody that is reporting it was nine-zero with no dissents has no idea either. So um, we're hoping uh, that our petition for certiorari will be taken up uh, in an expedited way, Buck, uh, to try to to try to give the American people a sense of clarity. 
Uh, but but I'll add one more thing: that the only date that really matters, uh, that constitutionally matters for for the Supreme Court, uh, is January twentieth. So. Uh, again, one of the things that I've learned uh, throughout this process is that the Supreme Court can pretty much do whatever it wants with regards to issuing a remedy as long as they follow the Constitution, of course. Um, and so, you know, the idea that, you know, with the media narrative is, oh, Parnell wants to throw out 2.5 million mail-in ballots, that that's not at all what we're asking to do. We're simply asking uh, the Supreme Court uh, at this point, the Supreme Court to follow the Constitution of the United States. And so um, we're still in the fight. Many in the media uh, have reported to the contrary, uh, but we intend to have our petition filed uh, at some point today, hopefully. We're speaking to Sean Parnell, former Army Ranger, current congressional candidate out in Pennsylvania and Western PA, uh, and he's at the forefront of this legal fight. Sean, what would be, in your mind, a just outcome from the perspective of the Supreme Court with regard to your specific legal challenge? Well, well, I, 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 it's a great question. I'd love for them to hear it on the merits first, and whatever, whatever outcome uh, or whatever whatever ruling that they that they provide, of course, will honor. Uh, you know, he, but I the reason why I'm I'm so steadfast in my pursuit of this is because Buck I believe that Pennsylvania and perhaps our nation uh, is really in the midst of a of a constitutional crisis. So in Pennsylvania, let's say the court says, yeah, 2020 was messed up. Act 77 is unconstitutional. We're going to kick this back to the legislature to fix this problem. If you want to pass Act 77? Do it the right way. Pass a constitutional amendment. Um, well, the problem with that course of action, while I would certainly accept it, and, and while many people believe that that would be eminently fair, uh, fix it moving forward, well, you're going to have 50% of the people in the state of Pennsylvania say, wait a second, the election in 2020 was unconstitutional and therefore illegal? 50% of the people aren't going to be okay with that. And you know, on, on the flip side, you know, if the Supreme Court says that, yes, Act 77 is unconstitutional, therefore any ballot submitted under that system is also unconstitutional and illegal, and we're tossing these ballots. Well, guess what? That is also a very explosive decision. And, and the truth of the matter is, Buck, there's really no easy answer here. But this is why what we would have be, what would be covered, Sean. Just so knows what would be covered under that umbrella of Act 77 ballots if the Supreme Court did that, which would be a huge move. What would be covered? Yeah. Well, okay. So you know, like any ballot, any no excuse absentee ballot. Would would be if if the Supreme Court did that right and and I really want to say if because they they could do whatever they want to remedy this situation right um, uh, if they did it would just be no excuse absentee ballots like any absentee ballot that was filled out in accordance with the Pennsylvania Constitution like you know military service is is one of the provisions where you can vote absentee uh, having to work having to be out of town. Uh, you're working at a poll and can't vote. All of those provisions are covered, covered under the Pennsylvania Constitution. Those ballots would still count. So again, anybody out there that's saying, oh, Parnell wants to discount military ballots, that's a lie. That's not true. Uh, the only thing we're talking about is no excuse absentee ballots. And, and the reason why this is a dilemma and, and why 2.5 million people, Democrats, Republicans, and independents are fired up about that. And guess what? They should be. Uh, but let's make sure that they're they're focused and putting the blame in the right spot. We're, we're talking about a a general assembly that passed an unconstitutional law, a governor that signed and implemented an unconstitutional law, an attorney general in the state of Pennsylvania who failed to opine on the constitutionality of the law at the time that it was passed, and a secretary of state that, that manipulated that law to benefit her own party and watered down ballot integrity. The, 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 the blame for disenfranchisement of the people of this commonwealth rests squarely on the Commonwealth government. And Buck, you know me, you know me for a long time. You know that I'm not a politician. You know that I'm not afraid to stand up to my own party. And that's part of what I'm doing here. The General Assembly is controlled by Republicans. I'm suing the General Assembly and I'm suing our radical Democrat governor and our radical Democrat attorney general, right? Because this is a constitutional issue. The constitution shields us all from government overreach, Democrat, Republican, and everybody in between. And, and that's what I'm fighting for. And at the end of the day, Buck, the most important part of the constitutional amendment process in this regard, right, in, in changing time, place, and manner of elections here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And by the way, Act 77 represents the most radical change in our Commonwealth's election ever. 
since our since the founding of our country, the most important part of the constitutional amendment process is that the people have a say. It, it was the it was the it was the intentions of the framers of the PA Constitution to make the amendment process that way to give the people a say. And also, every instance in the state of Pennsylvania, upheld by the Supreme Court, PA Supreme Court, by the way, every instance of an ex- unconstitutional expansion of absentee ballots, uh, it, it's been struck down. Uh, it's been struck down by the PA Supreme Court. So in order for the PA Supreme Court to even rule against us, they have to overturn 184 years of their own ruling precedent, which is why they dismissed us on on, on a technicality. So you know, I'm in this fight because it's the right thing to do. It's not the easy thing to do. It's not what most politicians would do, uh, but we're in this for the people and we're going to continue fighting for them. Speaking of Sean Parnell, congressional candidate, he's involved in this lawsuit. They're filing today to try to get the Supreme Court to hear it on the merits to see if uh, it is agreed by the court that Act 77 in Pennsylvania was unconstitutional. Sean, before we let you go, you've mentioned to me before that when you check the signatures on on ballots that came in from specifically some nursing homes in Western PA, that it was fishy. Do we have any further information on that? Do we have any confirmation? Because I think one of the big challenges people have is we hear so much in all these affidavits or read and and hear from witnesses on these affidavits of fraud that they saw. But ironclad proof, as in 100 signatures from different ballots that all look the same, that would really be helpful. Where are you in that? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And so for your listeners and viewers, we we did a random sampling of 2000 ballots here from four different nursing homes in Beaver County. Um, We did a freedom of information request to grant access to get access to that information. Uh, After looking at it for five minutes, we realized that most of the handwriting was the same. The signatures appeared to be forged. Uh, So what we've done, Buck, is we've turned that information over the to the district attorney in Beaver County. He's looking at it. He's asked us a couple follow up questions to get information on on the ballots and, and where they came from. And if the, once the district attorney's investigation is done, he'll send it up to the to the uh, U.S. attorney for the Western District of Pennsylvania. And so here's the challenge, Buck. We're in a very short timeline, right, to, to certify this election. As you mentioned, January 20th is going to come around pretty quickly, right? Uh, the problem is. It were on a very short timeline, and it just takes time to do these investigations. So right now, the uh, the district attorney here in Beaver County uh, has those ballots and has that evidence, is in the process of, of conducting an investigation. Hopefully, he finishes that investigation soon and sends it to the next level. Sean Parnell, everybody. The man is in the fight. He was when he was in <laughs> Afghanistan, and now he is back here at home. Sean, my friend, good luck. Keep us in, keep us in the loop, okay? Yep. Thanks, Buck. I appreciate it. This holiday season, it's not as easy as it usually would be to see people. Some folks are going to want to keep their distance because we know things are challenging right now, right? So what's a way you can reach out? Bring some cheer. Bring some holiday love, smiles, and hugs to people without actually being able to hug them necessarily. Bloomsy Box. I've sent Bloomsy Box flowers to my girlfriend. I've got them going to family members. They're amazing. These are fresh-cut flowers right from the farm, and they get sent to your home or to the home of a loved one, and that's a great way to reach out over this holiday period and show you care. It'll really brighten up their day, give them a great smile, and tell them you're thinking about them, even if you got to be a little far away during this holiday season. So go to bloomzybox.com, use the promo code BUCK, I'll get you 15% off with that promo code. Bloomzybox, B-L-O-O-M-S-Y box.com. That's bloomzybox.com. Promo code BUCK will get you 15% off and only seven days left to have your flowers arrive by Christmas. So order today. And now we have Eric Swalwell, who has been swindled by the by the Chinese. But what's even more interesting here is, why did he attack the American director of intelligence, John Radcliffe's report, talking about the expansion of China spying throughout? He attacked last week. Just last week, he attacked the director, John Radcliffe, defending China. Yeah. 
This man should not be in the Intel Committee. He's jeopardizing national security. What is being said in those meetings inside the skiff that we don't want other people to hear or listen? You can't not you cannot take in your watch. You cannot take in your phone. Mm -hmm. But here we have an individual who Nancy Pelosi, this is the real question. When did Nancy Pelosi know of this? And why did she, he main, why did she maintain him on the committee? Questions that should be answered, but I think we all know they're probably not going to be answered. But I appreciate that, that Congressman McCarthy is asking them. Of course, these, oh, this whole thing is going to turn into a lot of media jokes with McCarthyism any moment now, if it has not already. I'm sure the Daily Beast and Slate and all the other uh, you know, lib clowns will be doing that very soon. But here's what I, I have to tell everybody about the Swalwell situation. He will face no real consequences for this. It's not going to happen. That's the, the beauty of being a Democrat, being a leftist who was a Russia collusion truther. You did your part. It, it's almost like you're a mafia hitman, and you know, now it's time for you to go to prison, and they're saying, well, no. We're going to make sure that, you know, we we get you out of the country and that you're you're fine. You're safe. We don't want you to to suffer for this. So they make sure that there are no consequences because you did your part for the mob. Right. That's what they're doing here. They're making sure they will make sure there's absolutely nothing that happens to Eric Swallow as a result of all this. And I, I even mean politically, it's not clear. There's, and I'm going to say this. People. Maybe don't want to hear this, but it's not, not clear at all that Eric Swalwell did anything illegal. It's just gross. It's gross. And it shows how open to being an agent of influence uh, a lot of Democrats, a lot of Americans are on behalf of the People's Republic of China. China is a very wealthy country now and highly sophisticated in its intelligence operations and has a vision that it is executing on against the United States. It has been for a long time. We have been asleep at the wheel. And there's also been a whole lot of at least uh, passivity on the part of American politicians on behalf of the People's Republic of China. And in some cases, complicity could be much worse. We've never really looked into this all that thoroughly, have we? For all the talk we had during the Trump years of Russia collusion and look at what they're doing with Trump and Russia and the Kremlin. The, the Russians, and I heard this from people that actually know Russia and Russian sentiment. I have friends who are from there and they, uh, I asked them whenever I could, what, what, what the, they think it's preposterous. It's like a big joke. The, Americans are, the American media is always, oh, Russia. Some of them think it's, it's pretty amusing. They, they probably enjoy it, but it's absurd. They knew it was absurd. But you want to talk about interfering in our election. China has so much more ability to influence things here. Remember, China was responding to Trump's sanctions against or Trump's you know, trade, uh, uh, tr trade war acts against China, whatever you want to call them, tariffs. There you go. Uh, China responded in such a way that they were specifically trying to target agricultural communities in more vulnerable states for Trump's reelection. So China actively tries to hurt Trump politically on behalf of his political opponents. That, that's a fact. We know this. Right? They're trying to play our system. And think about all the other ways that they're doing that right now. Think about all the other mechanisms for, for China on this. Um, we're just beginning to un uncover them more fully. I mean, Eric Swalwell, you know, he... He, he, did, did he say anything? Did he leak any classified? There's, there is no evidence. And that's a very serious allegation. There's no evidence of that yet. Was he way too favorable toward China? Did he have a sort of a soft spot for China that was cultivated on behalf of, or rather at the behest of a Chinese government agent who was basically working him? Yeah, that, that is very possible. And in some ways that might even be much more, much more valuable. And it really depends on what the long-term goals were of this particular influence operation. So Swalwell can try to run away from this as much as he wants, but the media will cover for him. I learned recently about home title theft, and this is a crime that you really want to avoid at all costs because it goes after your most valuable asset, your home. But the usual identity theft services don't protect you. You need to learn about what this is, and then you can take the steps to protect yourself. 
That's why you should go with Home Title Lock. But first, understand that what the bad guys do is they use a quick claim deed after they find your home's title online because it's there, it's in the cloud, it's on servers. They kick you off your own home's title. Then they take loans against your home and you'll get often payment demands in the mail, perhaps even a foreclosure notice before you even know what's happened. HomeTitleLock.com can create a virtual barrier around your home's title. That's the way to protect yourself. It's how I protect myself. Go to HomeTitleLock.com, use the promo code RADIO, that will get you 30 free days of protection, and you can check at HomeTitleLock.com to see if you're a victim of this crime and don't even know it. HomeTitleLock.com, promo code RADIO for 30 free days of protection. Oh my gosh, talk about karma. If this doesn't show that God has a sense of humor, then what in the world does? For years, he and others made these accusations against people for which there was zero evidence. For years, they came out day after day after day from the Intel Committee hearings and leaked information about these individuals. And, and which, we, which we now know in which we would say, hey, none of this stuff that they're saying is true. And while he has this background and this history, like I said, the karma on this is as thick as mud. It's really ironic that he would find himself in this position after their behavior for the last right. four years. Uh, I mean, it shows the judgment of a 12-year-old right. that he would have involved himself in this relationship and then, and then acted the way he did for the last, as I said, four years throughout the Russia investigation well, and impeachment. I got to tell you, if you're, if you're an intelligence officer in this country, if you work in the intelligence community, you know, you would have to be very careful and your clearance would probably get revoked. I mean, if you you're you got a foreign national and all these ties, all these things come up and, you know, you're this guy. If he were just an employee with a security clearance, he would lose it. And, and probably get fired. And that's where it would stop, I think, honestly. I know right now I could say, oh, he'd go to prison for 20 years. And would say, yes, retweet, click. We love it. No, that wouldn't happen. But he would get fired. He would lose his clearance. And more to the point, this is a guy who was completely and absolutely just reckless, absolutely reckless when it came to allegations against other people. So I understand when I say there's no evidence that he committed treason or that he passed along classified information, some people will bristle at that a little bit. Because, and I understand this because they're like, why are you giving him the benefit of the doubt on that, Buck? He didn't give Trump it. And that's a fair point. That's a fair point. This guy was a smear artist. Not a very bright one either, but a smear artist. Just riding that Russia wave as far as he could against a sitting president and used it, unfortunately, to some effect to harm the administration. This was not without consequence. This did not happen in a way where it wasn't a big deal. There were investigations. There was a special counsel. There were people who were put in criminal jeopardy. Some even faced criminal charges and were convicted, all because of people like Swalwell running around lying about Russia collusion. Devin Nunes, who is really one of the unsung heroes of this whole thing because he took so much heat in the early days. And I remember sitting down with him in, in Congress back in, I don't know, 2018. And talking about this, and you know, he was. They were saying all kinds. Oh, what Nunes is saying is crazy about about the spying on the Trump campaign and the FISA stuff. And oh, FISA is all legit, and nobody would ever lie. They lied and lied so much; it's hard to even keep track of it all. Devin Nunes is having a little moment of Schadenfreude right now over what's going on with uh, his colleague in the Congress, Swalwell. Play six. Well, look, this is something that was uh, all, all new to uh, the American public uh, and to many people in Congress. And I think uh, the, the answers so far that we're seeing out of, uh, out of Swalwell, uh, who ran around, let's not forget, for four years uh, accusing everyone of being Russian agents. Uh, let's not forget, he was a what I call a P-tape truther. He was promoting the dossier, the still dossier that involved supposedly Donald Trump and prostitutes and all this stuff. 
enough. Well, the whole time he knew uh, that he had some some of his own issues. I think we have a situation of the pot calling the kettle black. Uh, so look, I think everybody needs to know uh, what did he know? When did he know it? Uh, what's been done since? Uh, are you going to push for a probe? Are you going to push for a probe? Are you going to push for a probe of this? Well, look, at this, down at, at, at this point, at this point, um, you know, this is not a decision that I get to make at this time. Uh, I think you've already seen our yep. leader, Kevin McCarthy, has said uh, that he should I think he said he should actually resign from Congress. Um, look, he has time here to come out and tell us what he said. And then we'll see. Is he going to get reappointed to the House Intelligence Committee next year? Uh, if that happens, that will be something that comes into my jurisdiction. And then we'll have to we'll you know, seriously have concerns about it. Remember, they said that Devin, the Democrats were out there saying that Devin Nunes was crazy. He should lose his place in the House Intelligence Committee for saying stuff that was true about Russia collusion lies and the way that they were going after Trump and using this as a weapon against the Trump administration and the way that the FISA process and the FBI and there was so much abuse and collusion going on behind the scenes. I mean, the real foreign intelligence collusion in the 2016 election was that the Hillary DNC paid a British, you know, operative to go gather a bunch of Russian disinformation, compile it together and then run it through the launder it through the FBI and the news media so that people would think that this stuff was true. That's the real foreign interference, a foreigner using foreign sources to undermine a president in an election year and the DNC paid for it. They paid for it. That's what happened. These are facts. And so that's why the, that we now have Eric Swalwell looking like he might have his own issue here. You know, a lot of members of Congress are just saying, well, you know, yeah, that's right. This is a guy who finds himself uh, facing perhaps the other side of this. You know, it, it's one thing to run around smearing other people, destroying their reputations making people think that they're traitors. I mean, remember, the president wasn't being accused. President Trump wasn't being accused. Well, they accused him of a lot of things, but it wasn't like, you know, uh, he was involved in some shady, shady land deal 20 years ago. There was that too, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't some minor thing. They called him a traitor. They said he betrayed his country. For a president to betray his country, what could be uh, a more extreme uh, denigration of someone's character at elected office and that to be a traitor to your country? I mean, Teddy Kennedy killed a woman and he was still in the Senate. Be a traitor to your country? I don't know if, well, you look at what Teddy Kennedy actually did in his conversations with the Soviets and a whole other conversation. But now we have, oh, but I saw uh, Molly Hemingway on Twitter pointed out, Andrew Cuomo got the Teddy Kennedy Leadership Award and Molly responded to this uh, when Cuomo was thankful about this, the governor of New York got this leadership award. She said, oh, that, that makes a lot of sense. Is it an award that's given out to people who kill people and get away with it? Because, yeah, Teddy Kennedy, folks, they covered it up. Just like they covered up the Hunter Biden under, uh, investigation of money laundering. It's a big story. That's a big story. The other stuff was gross, but criminal acts by the would-be president's son, you'd think that that would get more attention. So, yes, Swalwell will be protected by the media, and I don't, I don't suspect there'll be much in the way of consequences for him because what do I always tell you? If you're a soldier for the left in the ideological war, they protect their own. They take care of them. Conservatives get left behind on the battlefield. Just, you know, just ask Scooter Libby. That's what Dick Cheney said to, to Bush about Scooter Libby, leaving a man behind on the battlefield. He was right. Conservatives get left behind. Sorry, don't want, don't want all the angry editorials of the Washington Post. Don't want that. Can't handle that. But at least we can tell each other we can speak the truth publicly. For now, until you know, Facebook and Twitter and these other companies decide that that's, that's not allowed either. That the truth, when it hurts Democrats, needs to be suppressed. And that becomes just the official, the official um, situation. All right, we'll just tell you, yeah, sorry, you're not allowed to criticize Democrats anymore. That kind of a, you think that's impossible? Why? They lied, they, they suppressed the Hunter Biden story, and that was very clear why they did that. Anyway, back to, uh, back to Swalwell. Congressman Stewart is pointing out what basically I am here by saying, yeah, Eric Swalwell, 
not exactly a guy who uh, should be loose about who he spends time with given his propensity for accusing others of being a national security risk. Play 16. Oh, my gosh. Talk about karma. If this doesn't show that God has a sense of humor, then what in the world does? For years, he and others made these accusations against people for which there was zero evidence. For years, they came out day after day after day from the Intel Committee hearings and leaked information about these individuals, and, and which, we, which we now know in which we would say, hey, none of this stuff that they're saying is true. And while he has this background and this history, like I said, the karma on this is as thick as mud. It's really ironic that he would find himself in this position after their behavior for the last right. four years. Uh, I mean, it shows the judgment of a 12-year-old right. that he would have involved himself in this relationship and then, and then acted the way he did for the last, as I said, four years throughout the Russia investigation well, and impeachment. Yeah, that's right. And here we have a PP tape truther Stuck in the honey pot. That's a headline you won't see anywhere. At this point, no gatherings outside your immediate family that are, in a sense, potted together. And what I mean by that is that the people who you have been with who haven't had outside exposures. So if your son and daughter are coming home from college, they're not part of your pod. Yeah, uh, You know, either they quarantine for 10 to 14 days or they're not part of what happens at the holidays. Don't get together with neighbors. No Christmas parties. There is not a safe Christmas party in this country right now unless everybody for the previous 10 to 14 days were potted. You know, I, I think many of my colleagues colleagues are saying, well, limit it to 10 people, whatever. You know, that's that's happy talk. We have to tell people what's happening. And as you're, you report these numbers every day, and I know that, that you don't grow insensitive to them. You understand these are all humans who have lost their lives, who won't be at the Christmas table this year. But at the same time, we keep telling people who are really upset with, we're you know, coming down too hard. I mean, look at how governors and mayors are taking the heat right now for trying to limit transmission. But look what's also happening. They're not limiting anything. That's the problem. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. How many times do we have to say this? They're wrong. It's not working. But they won't give up. Just dug in on this. Listen to us. Listen to us. Listen to us. Most deaths ever in one day in the U.S. from COVID-19. Most cases ever in one day in one week in the United States. Most deaths, most cases in Germany and other European countries, too. They're hitting records. It's not because we're not masking enough. We have all kinds of regulations in place. We have all kinds of things that we're being told to do that will stop this. They will not. It will not stop it. They can keep saying this. It's just getting more and more annoying now. It will not stop it. Just just watch. You know what they're going to say in a week or two? You're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. Two weeks after that, the virus is still going to be spreading. Sorry, guys. You're not you're not doing enough. Yeah. And that's where we are. That is the reality. They won't say that. Interesting study out of, uh, out of South Korea. So they, because they have a low level of cases in South Korea, a lot of theories about why that is. I've heard that it's because South Korea has already had a lot of cross-reactive rea- cross T-cell immunity built up from other respiratory diseases that have come uh, out of China, I don't. I'm, by the way, these are theories. I do not. I'm not saying they're true. I don't know, but you know, we're told that in South Korea they have a very good uh, test and trace program, and they've managed to f- figure this out, um, so that they don't have, they have not had the pandemic the way that many other many other countries have. But they did a test and trace on a high school student, and the only case that they could find. Uh, the only case that they could find was somebody who was 20 feet away from a person while dining indoors, 20 feet away while dining indoors for less than five minutes. Now, I just want, I just want everyone to understand this. How many times have you been told six feet, stay away six feet, and that this is based in science? Do you know what the six feet comes from? 
some study a long time ago that had to do with droplets, and it was really initially three feet. So the World Health Organization's guidance was stay three feet away from somebody to avoid droplets. What do you think it really does to stay three feet away from somebody to avoid droplets if they're telling us now, according to this study, I know, oh gosh, I can't put this on Twitter or Facebook. They'll ban me for saying it. it's a study published, New York Post mentioning it here. The Journal of Korean Medical Science put this out. All right. They had had no, this was in North Geola province. The restaurant, uh, the restaurant there, they hadn't had any infections in a month. And the high schooler traveled and they checked his GPS cell phone data. And she had briefly overlapped in a restaurant with a saleswoman who contracted COVID-19 while traveling for business. And they had the same strain of the virus. So they're pretty sure that's how she got it. And when they did the, when they did the test and trace, what they found out is that 20 feet away was the closest this woman was. And it was for less than five minutes. And she got infected. Okay. Now, now, now here's, we, here's the other part of this. All these people that are going, wear the mask because it stops the droplets. It stops the droplets. This is what we're told, right? This is what's drummed into our heads. Wear the mask. It's up. Do we think that a, a droplet, I mean, that, that would be the heat-seeking missile of droplets. But if you are spreading virus into the air and the virus actually is aerosolized and just moves with airflow, what do you really think a loosely draped kerchief with Biden-Harris 2020 on your face is going to do? I'm just, I would want to ask people that. Oh, it, it, it super filters the air that you're breathing in? What do you think that a loosely affixed, affixed, uh, affixed mask of any kind is really going to do? I'm a N95 mask, yes. N95 mask, properly fitted, worn the whole time, will offer protection. I've never, I've never said that that wasn't true. I've read the studies that say that that's true. Everyone's always thought that's true. That's not what we've been told. That's not what we're doing now. So 20 feet away, I, you know, start asking people questions about this and, and see what their answers are. Ask, ask medical doctors, how could the virus spread 20 feet in less than five minutes? But our test and trace program in New York City, for example, is premised upon there being at least 15 minutes of indoor contact with a person for the virus to spread. We have so much about this that we still do not know. There is so much here that they just pretend is not an outstanding question. Is this, is this South Korean study? Is this fake? Is this false? Is this fake news? I, I just want, oh, uh, they'll say it's only one study. Yeah, but... If one person can get infected from 20 feet away, I, I'm, I'm sure they were masked up, at least when they weren't eating. Mask up between bites. How protected does anybody really think they are if this can, by, by their masks and their six feet of social distancing, if this can happen? But don't ask any questions. Just do what you're told. Don't see your loved ones over the holiday. Just do what you are told. The public health authorities won't come clean with the American people on how much they don't know about this, how wrong they've been about this, and that they're, the guidance that they're just now, they're just nagging everybody. We all know. We understand the rules. And then when we point out how arbitrary the implementation of so many of these rules are, they yell at us. We all know. And, and yet they just repeat themselves. They never have real answers to these questions. Thankfully, I do believe that this this vaccine within 90 days will bring us way down with this virus. And within six months, only people who love the power, love living in fear, don't want to go back to normal life, will think that we can't live normal lives again. Within six months, when this vaccine gets distributed to tens of millions of Americans, there'll still be people that want you to mask up, that you know want you to be running on the treadmill with a mask on, hope you don't pass out, right? But normal people won't feel that way. 